Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the opioid receptors. Okay, right. Uh, so we're currently discussing how it is that the opioid uh, receptors produce analgesia when activated. Okay, so we're currently in the process of looking at how uh, pain is transmitted from the site of pain up to the brain. Okay, so we've seen how pain is transmitted from the site of pain, pain into uh, the spinal cord. Okay, this is via these A delta or C fibers, uh, which um, have their uh, sensory processes uh, at the site of pain. Then certain molecules that are released by an area which has been damaged will activate uh, the sensory neurons, and action potentials will be fired down these pain neurons, and they have their cell bodies within the dorsal root ganglion, and then send a central process into the spinal cord, and this will go into the Zauer's tract, and then it will uh, break up into several processes like so, and these processes will go up and down, and then they will enter the grey matter of the spinal cord at different levels. What do they then synapse are on in the grey matter? Well, they're going to synapse on the next neurons along. And they synapse in an area called substantia gelatinosa, which is around rexed lamina 1 and 2. Some people quote it as rexed lamina 2 and 3. The message is clear that it's around this area here. Okay? Uh, so, what's going to happen is you're going to synapse on the next neuron along, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to show it there. Um, I'll have a go. Here's the next neuron along, okay? And it's within the substantia gelatinosa, which is around here. So it's got its cell body in the gray matter of the spinal cord, in the dorsal horn in this substantia gelatinosa region. Now, the central process of the primary neuron is coming in, and I might have to redraw uh, this, okay? Because I, it's not showing up particularly well on that picture. So, um, let's redraw the spinal cord then. So, uh, we draw our oval here. At the front, we've got the um, anterior sulcus or the ventral sulcus, okay, like so. And then we need to put on the grey matter of the spinal cord. Uh, so, we've got the tract of the Zawa right at the back, and then we've got the dorsal horns in front of that. And then in front of those, the ventral horns. Okay, and we've discussed how the grey matter of the ventral horns is divided up now. So right at the back, we've got the tract of the Zawa here, which I'll again highlight in pink. And now, uh, coming into uh, the dorsal horn, we've then got these um, terminals of the central processes of the sensory neurons. So they come in, and they will synapse on the next neuron along, which is in the substantia gelatinosa, okay? And this synapse is going to be key, basically. This is the point where um, many of the descending pathways that influence pain uh, experience will act. And in addition, opioids will act on this synapse, but we'll come back to that because it's more complicated. Opioids are extremely complicated drugs, okay? They act all over the place, and they act at several points in the brain as well. So we'll come back to that right at the end. But for now, know that this is a glutamatergic synapse. So the uh, sensory neuron is releasing glutamate onto the next neuron along, and of course glutamate is generally an excitatory neurotransmitter, so it will excite the next neuron along. This neuron will then send its axon out, and it will go into this uh, little commissure here, this connection between the two, uh, which is known as the anterior commissure of the spinal cord. So don't, don't confuse that with the anterior commissure in the brain. Okay, so the axon will cross over onto the opposite side of the spinal cord, and then it will go into this sort of position, and then it will start going directly up. Okay, and of course, it won't be alone. There will be absolutely loads of these neurons doing the same thing. So there's loads of uh, pain neurons, primary pain neurons coming in, synapsing on these secondary neurons, which will then cross in this anterior commissure of the spinal cord here and into this sort of position over here. And then they will all run up the spinal cord in this sort of position here. Okay, so. Let's show the spinal cord now in uh, its axial um, position, okay, like so. And basically, you've got this 
collection of axons all running up at the front of the spinal cord on the left hand side now and they've all come from over here basically and of course at loads of different at all the different levels you'll be having uh, these axons coming into this tract as it's called okay so this is what's known as the spinothalamic tract Okay, so all the different levels of the spinal cord will be contributing axons into this. Okay, specifically this one that I'm drawing here, this is the left uh, spinothalamic tract. And the reason it's called that is it goes from the spine and it's going to go up to the thalamus, basically. So this is the left spinothalamic tract. Okay, and it's carrying the axons of these secondary neurons uh, which are going up, okay, and they're from the right hand side basically, okay, so they were innovated by a primary sensory neuron on the right hand side, okay, now of course you'll have another one on the uh, right hand side this time, so you'll have the right spinothalamic tract, uh, which are also highlight in turquoise, and this will have uh, the axons running in it from the left hand side. So again, uh, primary pain neurons coming in from the left hand side will synapse on these secondary neurons which are within the substantia gelatinosa of the dorsal horn of the left hand side of the spinal cord, and again these will have axons coming out which will then cross in the anterior commissure and go into uh, the right spinothalamic tract and then ascend on the opposite side. So this is important to understand. The pain neurons from the left-hand side of your body, okay, so if I just draw a little picture of this, okay, so if this is you, uh, this is your left-hand side here, this is your right-hand side, so you're facing towards us, okay? Basically, the pain neurons from the left-hand side of your body will be ascending on the right-hand side of your spinal cord in the right spinothalamic tract, which I'll put here, okay? Whereas, uh, the uh, pain neurons from the uh, right side of your body will be ascending in the left side of your spinal cord in your left spinothalamic tract. Okay, so, um, that's the spinothalamic tracts done. We now need to see where they're going up to, so that we know they're going up in the spine, but they will go through portions that are above the spine as well. They will go through the medulla, the pons, the midbrain, until they finally get to the thalamus. So let's get some... Oh no, we've got this side to use. Okay, so let's now draw this. So, we have our spinal cord here, and I haven't left enough space. Um, um, unless I sort of make it smaller, I will make it smaller. Okay, so here is the spinal cord, but now I can't show what I want to show as effectively. Yeah, I'm going to start again. Okay, I'll get rid of that. Right. So, let's take up a whole piece of paper this time. So, we'll have the spinal cord here, okay, like so. And then above the spinal cord, we'll then have the medulla. Okay, so this is the spinal cord. And we know, actually, we'll fill in what we know first. We know that here come up the spinothalamic tracts. So here is the right spinothalamic tract carrying pain fibers from the left side of the body. And here is the left spinothalamic tract carrying the second order pain fibers from uh, the um, right side of your body. Okay, so here they are. Okay, and they've got absolutely loads of fibers coming in. So we'll follow the path of a single one of these fibers, however. So remember, our single second order fiber was coming up in the left spinothalamic tract because the primary uh, pain neuron was originally on the right side. Okay, so up comes our secondary neuron, and it might actually be helpful to draw our picture of the spinal cord and have it here again. So I think I'll do that. So I'm just going to recopy out our picture of the spinal cord here, which is the level at which this um, primary pain neuron actually came in. Okay, so here's the spinal cord, and let's just divide it up into the grey matter and the white matter. So here is the grey matter here. Okay, like so. And basically, we know that the primary pain neuron came in. It then went up and down in the Lizauer's tract here, and then it synapsed onto this second-order neuron, which then crossed over 
into the spinothalamic tract and this has now ascended so I'll draw it like this but you obviously have to imagine that it's going upwards it's coming out of the page and then it's ended up here because we're these two pictures are on different angles basically okay so this here then is the left spinothalamic tract here okay and basically the axons that are running in this left spinothalamic tract uh, they're heading up for the brain now so what sits at the top of the spinal cord then, okay, which is the first portion of the brain that this uh, spinothalamic tract is going to reach? Well, it's the medulla, okay, so we'll draw the medulla here, okay, and basically the spinothalamic tract is destined for the uh, thalamus, okay, so it's just going to go straight through the medulla, okay, so here is the medulla, okay, then sitting on top of the medulla, and I'm going to have to draw things smaller so that they're all going to fit in, okay? Sitting on top of the medulla, you have the pons, although ideally the pons would be shown bigger than the medulla. Okay, so I'm just drawing the structures of the brain stem here. So this is the pons. Then on top of the pons, you have the midbrain, which has this uh, these two uh, projections outwards, known as the crus cerebri. So I'll show them, okay? So it's sort of got this uh, Mickey Mouse structure when you view it from above. And these are the two ears of Mickey Mouse coming out here. Okay. So there's our midbrain sitting on top of the pons. Okay. And then finally, sitting on top of the midbrain, you then have the thalami. Now you actually have two thalami. Uh, you have a left thalamus and a right thalamus. And these are basically like egg structures sitting on top of the midbrain. Okay, so we'll have one here and one here. Okay, like so. So. Um, it might be helpful to draw the same thing from a side view because this is the front view, okay? So if we look from the side, what we'd see is something that looked like this. We'd have the spinal cord here, then we'd have the medulla above that, okay? Then we'd have the pons, and this shows the pons as its more normal size. Then we'd have the midbrain on top of that, okay? maybe something like that. And then sitting on top of the midbrain, we'd see one of the thalami. We'd maybe see the left thalamus if we were looking uh, from the left-hand side, as we are doing in this picture. OK, so let's highlight up these different portions. So here in orange, this is the medulla, which we've got here. OK. And then on top of the medulla, we've then got the pons, uh, which I'll highlight in blue. Okay, so on top of the medulla in blue here, this is the pons. Okay, and then on top of the pons, we've then got the midbrain, which here we're seeing from the front, here we're seeing it from the side, so we're not seeing this little um, wedge that you've cut out there. Okay, so here is the midbrain in purple. Okay, this is this portion, like so. Okay, and then on top of that, shown rather lamely in this picture, but I hope it's better communicated to you what they look like in that picture. Okay, you've got the thalami on the top there. Okay, right, and those are egg-shaped, and you've got two of them perched on the two halves of the midbrain here. Okay, so let's colour them in. Okay, so we'll have them in turquoise as well. And these are what um, the spinothalamic tract are heading for. So the left spinothalamic tract is heavy, heading for the left thalamus up here, and then the right spinothalamic tract is heading for the right thalamus. Okay, right. So the spinothalamic tracts will just go straight through the medulla, uh, the pons, and the midbrain, okay, until they get to the thalami, okay? So I'll show this for the left spinothalamic tract going up to the left thalamus here. So here it goes up to the left thalamus. Now, what I want to discuss with you now is the different nuclei of the thalamus, okay? So I want to discuss the structure of the thalamus because it's split into a number of different nuclei and um, there's a specific nuclei, uh, nucleus rather, which this um, spinothalamic tract is heading for. So let's now discuss the structure of the thalamus. 
Okay, so what I'm now going to do is draw a picture where we're looking down at the thalamus from above. So imagine looking down onto the thalamus, and I want to draw what you would see. Okay, so you'd see an egg shape, basically, like so. Okay, and I'm only drawing one of these, remember, I'm not drawing both of them. I'm drawing the left thalamus, okay? So, basically, this is the anterior portion, this is the posterior portion, this is the lateral side, and this is the medial side. I hope you're oriented now. So your eyes will be here, uh, the back of your head will be over here somewhere, your ear will be over here, and this is your uh, midline of your head, if you like. Okay, right. So, the thalamus has a special structure that divides it up, okay, which is known as the lamina, basically. Um, okay, um, so this is the thalamic lamina. Okay, and it divides it up like so. So this is the shape of the thalamic lamina. Okay, so in blue, this splits the thalamus into these three separate sections. Okay, oops, I'll just sort of complete it there. Okay, so now let's talk about the different nuclei of the thalamus. Okay, so this is the thalamic lamina. Okay, and we're drawing the left thalamus. So the thalamic lamina back here curves in towards the medial portion, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, the different nuclei then. So this big nucleus that you've got on the medial aspect of the thalamic laminus here, lamina here. This is called the medial nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, and I will colour in the medial nucleus of the thalamus in green. Okay, so this here is the medial nucleus of the thalamus. This is not the one which the uh, spinothalamic tract is heading for. Okay, this nucleus that's right at the front here, you might be able to guess what this is called. This is the anterior nucleus. So the nuclei of the thalamus are all pretty sensibly named, okay? They're named according to uh, what position they're in, okay? Now, this portion here is more complicated. This is split up into loads of separate nuclei. So there's one big one right at the back here, okay, which I'll colour in. Uh, pink, and I've just realised I have forgotten to colour in the anterior nucleus. So I'll do the anterior nucleus in red, and then we'll move on to this big nucleus at the back here. Okay, so this big nucleus at the back here is known as the pulvinar nucleus. Okay, so this is the pulvinar nucleus, or often people just call it uh, the pulvinar. Okay, then you also have a large nucleus that runs all the way back here, okay? And this is known as the lateral dorsal nucleus, okay? So I won't colour that in turquoise, because I want to save for turquoise uh, the one that the spinothalamic tract is actually heading for, okay? So here in yellow, this is the lateral dorsal nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, and I want to stress that we're looking from above, but these nuclei go all the way down, so it's not just the top, you know, the entire segment. I could cut out this entire segment, and all of that will be the medial nucleus. So it goes the entire way through the height of the thalamus, basically. Okay, so this one that we've just talked about is the lateral, because it's in the lateral compartment of the thalamus, if you think about it. This is the medial portion. And this is the lateral portion, and it's behind the anterior portion, so it's the lateral dorsal nucleus. Okay, uh, next uh, we split the remaining portion into three separate portions here. Okay, and this first one up here is known as the ventral anterior nucleus, so it's, um, it's the one that's most all of these are called ventral nuclei, okay? This is the one that's most far forward, so it's the ventral anterior nuclei, okay? So this is the ventral anterior nucleus. Uh, and I'll colour in the ventral anterior nucleus in orange. Then the one uh, behind it is known as the ventrolateral nucleus. Okay, so I'm colouring in the ventral anterior one currently in orange. Uh, then behind it, and we're running out of space over there, so I'll put the names down here now. The one behind it is called the ventral lateral nucleus. 
okay? And sometimes people will combine it into ventrolateral nucleus, uh, but ventrolateral nucleus, you get the same point across, okay? And we'll colour that one in pink. So here in pink, that's the ventrolateral nucleus. And then the final one that's right at the back is then the ventral posterior nucleus. And this is the one that we're interested in. This is the one uh, which the um, spinothalamic tract is going to end with. Okay, so this is the ventral posterior nucleus. And the ventral posterior nucleus is sometimes just abbreviated to the VP nucleus. Now, another important thing to say about it is that it's split into two portions. There is the ventroposterolateral nucleus and the ventroposteromedial nucleus. For our purposes, the spinothalamic tract synapses on the ventroposterolateral nucleus. So let me show the two portions of it. So to be able to see the two different portions of the ventral posterior nucleus, what we need to do is imagine taking a knife and cutting this nucleus out and then having a look at it. What would we actually get? We get something that looked kind of like this, okay? So here it is, and I'm, I'm regretting trying to draw a 3D picture now. Okay, where do I put that? Okay, it's just going to have to sort of go off like that. Okay, so we've got this sort of uh, semicircle uh, portion here, basically, um, and I'll just highlight it in turquoise. So basically, it can be divided into two portions, okay? There is a portion that uh, faces into the medial portion, okay? So there's a portion here that is very medial, and this portion is called the ventroposteromedial nucleus. So this is the medial portion of the ventro, uh, ventral posterior nucleus. So it's called the ventral posteromedial nucleus. So the ventroposteromedial nucleus. And then medial nucleus. And sometimes that will be abbreviated to VPM nucleus for short. So ventral posteromedial is often abbreviated to VPM for short. Okay, so I'll highlight it in vivid purple. So this is a portion that I cannot show you just from this picture because it's hidden deep within the uh, ventral posterior nucleus. And what's left, the portion that covers up the ventral posteromedial nucleus, this is called the ventral posterolateral nucleus. So ventral and then posterolateral nucleus. Posterolateral nucleus. And the ventral posterolateral nucleus is often abbreviated to VPL for short, the VPL nucleus, the ventral posterolateral nucleus. Now, clearly you can see that the ventral posterolateral nucleus is far bigger than the ventral posteromedial nucleus. And this is the main one which the spinothalamic tract is synapsing on. So both of the thalami, both the left thalamus and the right thalamus, they both have a ventral posterolateral nucleus nuclei, okay, and they both face out onto the lateral portion, so I want to stress that what I've drawn here is this left thalamus here, okay, so this one here, but you'll have the mirror image of it on the other side, okay, so if I draw the mirror image of this, so here's the egg, and again we're viewing from above, okay, then you have this uh, thalamic lamina here, Okay, and it will be facing out towards this side this time. And you'll have the medial nucleus here, the anterior nucleus here. Then you'll have the pulvinar at the back here, this um, lateral dorsal nucleus here, and then the free ventral anterior, ventral lateral, and then ventral posterior nucleus here. And then the ventral posterior lateral one will be the outer covering of this ventral posterior nucleus that faces out laterally. Okay, so both of the spinothalamic tracts come up into these ventral, postero, uh, ventral posterolateral nuclei, okay? And there they synapse on their third neuron, okay? So that we've had the second order neuron climb all the way up to the thalamus, specifically to the ventroposterolateral nucleus of the thalamus, and then it will finally terminate on another neuron, and this neuron will then project off to portions of the cortex. Okay, now which portions of the cortex can it project to? 
Well, basically, there are three major portions that it can project to. The primary somatosensory cortex, the insular cortex, and also the anterior cingulate cortex. So let's talk about where these three portions of cortex are. So we'll start with the primary somatosensory cortex, which is the easiest. Okay, so if we are viewing a brain from the side, okay, so let's say this is a brain viewed from the side, okay, Basically, there is a huge landmark that you can see when looking at a brain from side on. There is a massive great crack down the middle, basically, and there are lots of um, sulci, as they're called, uh, on the brain, but this one is a big one, okay? And this is, this is usually distinguishable on most brains. This is the central sulcus. Okay, now the strip of cortex that is immediately behind the central sulcus, this portion here, this is the primary somatosensory area, okay, or the primary somatosensory cortex, or it's just usually abbreviated to S1 for somatosensory area 1. So this is the primary, because it's the first one, and then somatosensory cortex, or if you're being less serious, just the primary sensory cortex. So matter-sensory is the full name for it, but sensory is fine. Okay, so this is in charge. Uh, well, this is where most of the uh, primary sensory information comes in, basically. Okay, so all of the information about touch, about temperature, about pressure, things like that, about vibration, all of that comes into the primary uh, somatosensory cortex. And also you're getting uh, these uh, projections uh, from the pain um, pathways. Okay, so it's also getting pain information coming in there. Okay, now there are some other portions of the cortex that are more special for pain inputs to specifically go there. Okay, and this is the insular cortex, which is supposed to actually uh, be very heavily involved in the conscious, unpleasant feeling of pain. Okay, so there have been experiments done, I think they're pretty illegal experiments, but they have been done apparently, uh, where you stimulate the insular cortex in humans and it apparently causes absolute agony. Okay, so it's uh, probably the portion that is involved in the sensation of agony, basically, of pain, the actual conscious sensation of it. Okay, so where is the insular cortex? The insular cortex is more difficult to show you. Okay, so basically, there is this sulcus between the temporal lobe here and the parietal lobe. If you stick your fingers into that sulcus, imagine sticking your fingers into that sulcus, basically what will happen is you'll follow around the cortex of the parietal lobe and the cortex of the uh, temporal lobe, okay? So let's show this. So here's the parietal lobe. I'm now viewing as though I've cut a cross section, basically. So imagine cutting down here and looking at what we're looking at the cross section basically it's a coronal section this is what you'll see here's the parietal lobe here so this is this portion here then it will start to invaginate inwards in this fissure here and it's called the lateral fissure so i should just write that down so this crack in the side of the brain is known as the lateral fissure Okay, and in addition, the temporal lobe is also invaginating backwards like so. Okay, so this is the temporal lobe down here. Um, I'm just making sure it's visible. Temporal lobe, and I'll move this up a little bit. And this here, this is the parietal lobe. Now, what happens if you follow this natural fissure for long enough is that it opens up and you get something that looks like this, okay? So you get a portion of cortex right inside, very deep inside the brain, basically. So if you follow this natural fissure around with your fingers, if you're putting your fingers in here, it'll suddenly open up, and then there's this portion of cortex here that your fingers will ram straight into if you're not expecting this to happen, okay? So this ending here, okay, this 
is the insular cortex. So you can't see it when you're just looking at the outside of a brain unless you actually, you know, cut away the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe to try and expose it. You're not going to be able to see the insular cortex. So it's hidden deep within the brain, basically. Okay, and this portion is going to receive projections from the ventroposterolateral nuclei. Uh, on both sides. Well, obviously the um, ventral poster posterolateral nucleus on the left side will project to the left insular cortex and the uh, ventral posterolateral nucleus on the right side will project to the right insular cortex. So you'll have one on both sides. So here's the um, right insular cortex. Let's assume uh, we're looking at this from behind. Okay, so this is the left insular cortex. So this is the right insular cortex here. Okay, and uh, as I say, the um, left ventroposterolateral nucleus, this one here, uh, will uh, project to the left into the cortex and the right one to the right into the cortex. Okay, and this seems to be involved in the conscious experience of pain. Okay, now, finally, the anterior cingulate cortex. Okay, this is again a one that's more difficult to show. And this is supposed to be involved in the emotional uh, experience of pain. So often pain makes people ups upset and it has emotional effects. And the anterior cingulate cortex is part of the limbic system, which is the uh, portion of the brain that's in charge of our emotions. Okay, so this seems to be the projections, uh, well, the area that the pain neurons project to, which is responsible for the emotional response uh, to pain. And the anterior cingulate cortex is often abbreviated to the ACC for short, A for anterior, C for cingulate, and then C for cortex. Okay, so if I draw a brain again, then let me explain to you how, how we're going to find the anterior cingulate cortex. Okay, so this is a view from the side. That's now a view from above, basically. So I want to look at this picture. Okay, what you'll see is something that looks like this. Okay. okay. So you see the two hemispheres uh, split apart by this great crack in between them. Okay, like so. Uh, and uh, this is known as the longitudinal fissure, this massive crack between the two uh, hemispheres. Okay, what we now want to do, if we want to find the anterior cingulate cortex, we have to put our fingers down uh, this longitudinal fissure and basically have a look at what's inside, what faces into the longitudinal fissure. So basically what I'm going to do is now take a sagittal section, I'm going to cut right between the two hemispheres, and then we'll be able to see uh, the anterior cingulate cortex if we view uh, the cross section, basically. Okay, so here then is, uh, let's say we've taken this hemisphere here, so the right hemisphere. Okay, so we'll get something that looks like this, and basically you'll find uh, a very noticeable structure here called the corpus callosum, which is the uh, white matter connection between the two halves of the brain. Okay, and uh, basically the portion of cortex that is immediately peripheral to that, okay, so there's a portion of cortex around this, uh, this is known as the cingulate cortex. Okay, and it's very distinguishable because there's a sulcus here that separates it off from the next portion. Okay, so this is the cingulate cortex. And the anterior portion of this over here, this is the anterior cingulate cortex here, the ACC. And this is very important in the emotional response to pain. Okay, so that then now concludes the ascending pain pathway. What we want to look at in the next video is the descending pathway for the modulation of pain, and then we'll be ready finally to discuss how opioids are going to uh, block or at least hugely reduce the sensation of pain.